Peter is addressed unto the Christians that are scattered over a wide area by reason of the persecution against Jerusalem as well as against the church that had been brought on by the Roman armies and the Roman powers. And Peter is endeavoring to bring to the attention of the saints, the Christians, that although they are scattered and suffering miserably because of the persecution, God is with them and the Lord is with them. And in the fourth chapter, he establishes certain points and principles that we want to look at in the early verses of 1 Peter chapter 4 that will always have deep bearing on the attitude and the motivation of Christians to do the very best that they can to glorify God and save themselves from an untoward generation. Peter on Pentecost used that phrase, an untoward generation. That is an era in which the people are going away from God rather than toward God. They are opposite to every virtue and they are denying every truth. And they repudiate every overture and every invitation to stand with God in the ways of righteousness and holiness. There isn't any reverence in their heart. Piety has indeed eluded them. They have lost godliness, and obedience is something that is foreign to them. And the question of faith is simply ignored. They want nothing to do with Jesus and Christ as, as Christ and the church. The fact of the matter is these people of the day in which Peter is writing had not only decided that they want nothing to do with it, but they have turned against it and are as Jews aiding and abetting the Roman armies in the persecution of the church, thinking that this would enable them to have a period of peace with the Roman armies. So, as Jesus had announced and prophesied, there would be the day in the early days of the church when the brother would turn against brother, that within families there would be those who would betray their loved ones who were faithful to Jesus Christ. And some of these who played the part of a traitor actually had believed for themselves a while and now were turning away in an effort to save themselves physically. But they were losing their souls eternally, and that is the concern of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4. So with those introductory remarks, let's read a few verses, gather the thoughts that Peter has for them and for us. We don't have persecution of this sort to face today, but the problems that we meet as Christians are parallel in the sense that they tend to destroy our motives for doing good or cause us to become weary in the doing of good and therefore we need the encouragement by understanding that God is with his people. And as we've said over and again, these thoughts are repeated and emphasized in the Old Testament and in the New. The Psalms chuck full of such a spirit as that, reminding the people that God is with the righteous and that the enemies of righteousness will never be able to prevail they will win the battle now and then, but the war isn't over until we stand before God in judgment. And the righteous men and women will not lose the war. They're going to stand with the Lord. The book of Revelation, regardless of how we approach it, comes to that conclusion. No matter what form of interpretation or what era in which we say the book of Revelation was written, or to whom it was addressed, the conclusion is always the same. Christ is going to conquer. He cannot be conquered. And if we stand with him, we will be victorious with him in the eternity of the after while. So 1 Peter 4 gives us this hope, gives us this encouragement, shows us who we are and what we can expect and how we can go, and motivates us to build an attitude that will bring success spiritually. 
For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Remember the cross. The Lord's Supper is a part of the worship of Christian men and women every Lord's Day. It is a monument to the cross. It is a memorial of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It reminds us vividly of the suffering that he endured on the cross for us. It reminds us that he died for us. And each of us should make it personal, make it individual. Jesus died for me. Each of us can say that. Jesus did not die for the sake of sin. His death removes sin or gives the power of the remission of sins, but in the very primary understanding, the technical point of it is this. Jesus died to save man from sin. He died for the sake of man. He did not die for sin. He died for man, man who is a sinner, that he might be cleansed of that sin and given peace and comfort, strength and hope, and made to know the love of God, the grace of God in a magnificent manner, and it is marvelously brought forward in his death. Remember Jesus. Remember his death. Christ suffered for us in the flesh. Jesus' flesh was just as our, our flesh. No difference at all. He had the same feelings. He had the same emotions, the same thoughts. He was tempted even as we are tempted. Whatever is in our flesh was in his. In all points he was tempted, but in all points of the flesh he is made like unto man. We're told in the epistles that he was made fleshly wise, just as man is made, that he might understand and know what we endure in this world, what we go through. Jesus knew what it meant to have deep joy in the heart. Jesus knew what it meant to have terrible sorrow in the heart. Jesus knew how to laugh, and he realized the joy of a happy occasion. He knew how to cry, and he wept bitterly at the grave of his friend, Lazarus. Jesus, in the flesh, was just as we are in the flesh. And he's able to succor us. He is able to answer all of the plagues that come against us. He knows what it is when the disease is there. He knows what it is when the heartache is there. He knows what it is to be betrayed by man. He knows what it is to lose confidence in man. He knows what it is that man can do when he rejects you, when he repudiates you, when that he in no wise shows regard or appreciation for you. Jesus knows. No man has ever been treated as mercilessly, as rudely as Jesus. And Peter sums it up. He suffered in the flesh for us. Now then, arm yourselves with the same mind. We're in a battle with sin, with Satan. The enemy is not Christ, the enemy is not the cross, the enemy is not the church, it's sin and Satan. Arm yourselves with the same mind, likewise, with the same mind. Begin to think as Jesus thought. Build an attitude that is identical with his. How is it that Jesus was able to die for us, suffer so much in the flesh for us? Arm yourselves with that attitude. On the surface, we can quickly see it in this way. Jesus had come from heaven. He therefore knew God the Father. 
There's no doubt in his mind of the existence of God, and Jesus being the second member of the Godhead has no doubt about the glories of heaven. He is the creator, the book tells us, and he left heaven to come into this world to die to save us from sin. He knew without doubt God is, heaven is, the soul exists, salvation is real. He knew that the resurrection is a fact, and he proves it in his own resurrection from the dead. There isn't an inkling of doubt. There is no suspicion. There is no cynicism. There isn't any wavering or being tossed to and fro by Jesus. He knew. And if we can know in the depths of faith, real confidence, God is, heaven is real, and life is eternal. We'll be able to tolerate what happens in this world so much the easier. But we have to arm ourselves with that mind, the attitude, the mind, it directs. Mary Baker Eddy came up with the ideas of mind over matter in a spiritual or in a religious sense. And to the trouble is that she has so much merit in the phrase mind over matter, but the carrying it to such an extreme as she carried it then causes people to forget about it or set the entire thing aside. This is the problem with error. It generally mixes itself with just enough truth that they destroy the truth in the minds of others that people turn a deaf ear to some phases or parts of certain teachings because of the horror of the error that is apparent. When she said mind over matter to the degree that, we would be, that there is no sickness and there is no death, we just think it, and as soon as we get our minds under control, we'll no longer be sick and we'll never die, people knew that she was wrong. And it was so far-fetched that her ideas of mind over matter are as well set aside. But I will control my body, which is matter, by my mind. This is that war that goes on between the spirit and the flesh, which Paul speaks of in the Roman letter through an entire chapter, declaring how that he is in a contest with that day by day and moment by moment, but he assures us that the spirit of a man, the mind of a man, the law of the spirit of Christ in the mind and the law of faith in the mind is able to conquer the flesh, the matter of man, bring it under control, direct it, and use it to the glory of God and to the peacefulness of man. Arm yourselves. Peter in another place will say, gird your minds, that is, Put the strap around your mind, belt around your mind. You're pulling it together. You're tightening it up. You're looking upon it as a muscle which is going to be used to the greatest degree of its strength and the support that that strapping or that girding will bring to the mind enables you to use it in all of its energy and therefore effectively carry out the very destiny of your life. Arm yourselves with that same mind. Application of arming yourself with the mind of Christ regarding suffering in the flesh. He that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Have you ever seen repentance worded that way? When we repent, Romans 6, we die to sin. But repentance is a tussle. Repentance is that determination, a decision that is made in the mind which governs the will, saying to the flesh, no more sin. I will from this day forward live in righteousness. I will not sin. I will live a godly life obedient, righteous, 
reverent life before God. The wrestling that we have to do is not believing that Jesus is the Christ. The wrestling in obedience that we have to do is not submitting to the ordinance of baptism in water for the remission of sins. The hardest problem that we face in obeying God in Christ is to make that determination in repentance that I must and will cease sin and I will live righteously. I am going to control myself. The body in that war has to deal with it, and repentance is here looked upon under these terms or phrases of wrestling in a war, suffering in the flesh, seizing from sin. We have battled the flesh with that mind. We have armed our mind in the likeness of the mind of Jesus, and we have battled with the flesh. The flesh wants to do wrong. The mind wants to do right. The conscience is leading us nearer to God, and the flesh is taking us down the way that Satan has trod. We are listening to him again, even as he came to Mother Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he is saying, Ye shall be as gods, and the flesh wants to go in that way, and he wants to deny everything that is high and holy and good, and the spirit of a man is drawn unto God and wants to obey everything that is good and deny everything that is devilish and satanic. That war is treacherous. And it is a suffering. It hurts. And we are deceiving ourselves if we say that it is easy to deny sin. We're stating a fact that is out of context. It's not so. It isn't easy. And we mustn't deceive ourselves into thinking it is easy. But once we have won that battle... It becomes easier and easier as day goes by to say no to sin. Once we've won that initial battle with sin in suffering in the flesh, then we will cease from sin. That he, should no lo that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. We noted then from James in the morning hour, the class period, that there is within man the lust of the eye, the flesh, and the vainglory of life. It is in every one of us. We are born that way. It is part of the flesh, and it is why that man is enticed, and it is why that man sins, because of those lusts that are there. Now, we are not going to live in obedience to those lusts. We will not serve that lust. We will deny it. We will rise above it, and we will serve the will of God. That's the war. That's the battle that he mentions in the last phrase of verse 1. The time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. In times past, while in sin, in the world, we live like the Gentiles, that is, pagans, outside Christ, outside the will of God. No consciousness of sin, that is, we weren't giving it any consideration. We weren't giving it any consideration at all, and we were satisfied. It was a life that sufficed. We were happy enough. People so many times will tell us when that we try to encourage them to give serious consideration to the gospel. Serious thought to the cross of Jesus Christ. Serious thought to their own sinfulness and the loss of their soul by their sinfulness. Serious thought to redemption that is in Christ. And they'll say, leave me alone. I am happy as I am. Don't bother me. Don't confuse me. Everything's all right as it is so far as I'm concerned. The life they have in sin suffices. They're content in sin. They have lived that way for so long, or have heard so little of the beauty of Christianity, or have heard distorted references to Christ and the church, that they do not want what Christianity affords. The distortions of Christianity by the teachings of men are very, very grave today. No doubt about that. And we would encourage you, don't let the distortions cause dismay. 
Don't let the distortions or the caricatures of Christianity that come from men cause you to turn a deaf ear to his call or cease to look into his word to find the way of life. For there is a way that is filled with beauty and holiness in Christ, peace and joy and eternity in Christ, comfort and strength and hope and love and grace in Christ not found elsewhere. The distortions misrepresent it. Find the truth, for it is rich. And do, don't allow yourself to become content with life as it is, walking in the way of the Gentiles, that is, in a pagan way, separate from Christ, in sin, cut off from God. That isn't adequate. He said they walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Many sins. And they thought nothing of it. It was a way of life. They thought it funny that some others didn't walk that way. They were so satisfied with sin that it was weird for others not to sin in the very way that they were sin, or to think that they should change their ways. They think it's strange that ye run not with them, Peter says in verse 4, to the same excess of riot, and they speak evil of you in your righteousness because you will not walk in the ways of their unrighteousness. Now, when we understand why the world frowns upon us or brings hurt and suffering to us, we realize that it is a compliment. They run to their excess of riot in sin. If we do not, they think it's strange, and they will ridicule and mock. They will cause us to hurt, bring mockery upon us, and heap upon us suffering in the flesh because that we will not run to the same excess of right as they do run. Therefore, they speak evil of the righteous. But they shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Peter denied Jesus just before the trials began, didn't he? Three times. And he had to look into the face of Jesus. And it broke his heart. It broke Peter's heart. He wept. When he realized what he had done to the Lord in denying him, Peter wept. And these men and women who run to the excess of riot while ridiculing Christians for not being mean and sinful will answer to that Jesus who died that we might live. They will have to look into the eye of Jesus as did Peter. And Paul writing to the Philippians said, Every knee shall bow, Every tongue shall confess. But it's apparent, isn't it? If it is at judgment that the knee bows and the tongue confesses, it's too late. For the period of probation spiritually is in this world and in our walk here. We are to hear the gospel and obey it that we might indeed be blessed by it. So in verse 6, For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Those who are the dead are those dead in sin, not dead from God and dead from man on earth, but dead in sin. And the gospel is therefore preached unto them that they might, although they're going to suffer in the flesh, live peaceably in the Spirit. The suffering in the flesh is going to come in two ways. That suffering in the flesh is going to come by the persecution of Rome and unbelieving Jews against the church. That suffering in the flesh is going to come also when we wrestle with sin, determining to give it up and to stand in righteousness and walk as righteously as we can in the will of God. That suffering is going to be there. And the point is, if we suffer in the flesh to the degree that we give in to the enemies of the cross and we do not repent and obey Christ in baptism, 
we will suffer more grievously than all, or we will have lost our soul. But if we will suffer through the persecution for righteousness' sake, remembering Jesus who suffered so much for us, we shall rise above that suffering in the flesh, and the Spirit will live. The Spirit will live. Saved. We'll be saved. And so it is. May I encourage you to be as strong as you can be in Christ, for there's no other way of peace and strength and hope. And if you haven't become a Christian, why not tonight? Why we stand? Why we sing?